Hi everyone and welcome to Smooth On Mold Making Casting Presentation on Skin Effects. My name is Greg Schrantz and I'm a material specialist here at Smooth On. Today I'm joined by Alex Hadger on video, Jason Reese as our moderator, Hello. and I have Heather Hanna here as my model for today. Uh, feel free to use the chat to ask any questions and we'll do our best to answer them. If for some reason we can't get to your question, use the description in the link below. Um, or, sorry, use the link in the description below to uh, go to our customer support page and submit a ticket and we'll get back to you. All right, so let's get into what we're going to be covering today. All right, so we'll be discussing the difference between latex and silicone, uh, how to pigment your silicone, so different tricks for that, applying silicone directly to the skin, making and casting into a wound plate, uh, applying pre-made wounds, and then how to paint those pre-made wounds after they've been applied. Uh, we'll also be talking about finishing that look with some ultimate blood. The materials that we'll be talking about today are Skin Tight, Silk Pig, Fuse FX, Smoothcast 300, Universal Mold Release, Dragon Skin FX Pro, Dermatac, Dermatac Remover, our ultimate blood kit that includes the blood base, colorants, fixo and thinner, and then two clays, the Siobhan NSP Hard and the Sculptex Hard. So here we're just going to look at some makeups really quick of some uh, techniques that, have, that we're going to be talking about today. So on the left here, we have just some direct skin tight applied right above the eyebrow just to create a small gash. Uh, and then on the right, we have a pre-made wound to just create a larger wound that is easier to apply very quickly. Both then are finished with a little bit of blood. Um, so very similar as far as what type of wound it is, just the scale and the technique being slightly different. And then here we get, we just have some more skin tight applied directly to the skin, and we have a little bit of extra makeup added to these. So with the, all the scratches across the face, we can see that we had some makeup to add some bruising, just to get the idea that uh, whoever this was uh, either skid across some road or got into a fight, and they have some bruising along with it. And then with the bullet wound, we have some makeup to add a little extra irritation around the entry wound, as well as, again, that blood coming down from there. And then here we actually have a full face makeup um, that's just used directly with just skin tight. And for this, it would be just multiple layers applied with different loads of pigment and different types of pigment just to create that depth look for that burn makeup here. So you can actually do an entire look with something like skin tight or you can do something very minimal. It's up to you. It's just gonna take longer if you do a larger look like this. And then of course, it doesn't have to be applied directly to the face. It can be applied anywhere to the body. So we have a piece that's been applied directly to a rib cage where it looks like an older wound. Um, so we have a, some darker blood that's been sitting out for a while as well as it's kind of thinned out, it's not gushing, uh, as well as, again, that newer wound that would be on the wrist uh, that is a lot more vibrant, has a lot more red to it. So we'll talk about today kind of some anatomy and understanding how the body works to know how to create a realistic look with our makeups. All right, so let's start with the difference between latex and silicone. Um, latex, of course, is the most common thing that people are going to use. Um, it's just widely available and it's usually uh, the first thing that people go to because the main benefit of it is it's less expensive than a lot of other materials people use for makeup. So that's the nice thing about it. It's very easy to get a hold of and again, just less cost for it. Uh, the next big benefit to it is it's extremely elastic. Um, latex is a natural rubber, so it does come from a tree. Um, and it's one of the great things about Mother Nature is it exceeds very well, where sometimes we can't. So with latex, it is one of the just most elastic materials available out in the market. Um, so works very well for doing makeup because it'll move with your actor well. Um, the other benefit is it is lightweight. Um, latex is a single component system, and then it air dries. So as it's losing that moisture, um, as it's evaporating and drying, it becomes lighter. So you can create very lightweight pieces with it. And if you go to more advanced techniques with foam, like foam latex, um, you can actually get an even lighter piece with it. So you can have a very large prosthetic and it still be very light. So 
That's just some of the benefits of using latex. However, no material is perfect, so there are some issues that do come up with latex. And the most common is it's an allergen. And it's a very common allergen, actually. So some people have varying reactions to it, from slight irritation to breaking out in hives to sometimes even worse. So you do need to be mindful of that. So whenever working with a model, I always recommend if they're not aware, if they do have a latex allergy, or an allergy to anything, I always do a test first. I usually do it on the wrist, and just do a little amount, let it sit on there for a few minutes. If there's any reaction, then I'll, I'll use something else if they do have that, uh, just so I don't cause any issues with them. Um, the other downside is it is typically a slower application because you are applying multiple layers, and you need to let each layer dry before you can apply the next. So that does take a little bit more time, you can use a hair dryer to help speed that up, uh, but of course, you can cause wrinkling to occur if you dry it out too fast. However, you can use that benefit if you're doing something like an old age makeup uh, to get those nice wrinkles. But if you're trying to do something that's nice and clean, you don't want that. Uh, the next big thing is latex is fairly opaque. It's not gonna be anywhere as translucent as silicone is, and definitely not as translucent as skin. Also, the older latex is, the more it darkens over time. Uh, so if you have a piece that's stored, um, it will change color, so it's going to require more painting. And that's the big downside to latex, is it does require a lot of painting to get it to have a nice realistic look. So it's a lot of putting down a base layer that's an undertone, and then going over top of what the main layer is, plus breakup. So it's a lot of painting that goes along with it, so it's a lot more time consuming in that aspect. Uh, and then we have silicone. Silicone's biggest benefit is translucent, and you can get silicone to have the same translucency as skin, which is really nice. Um, so it's very easy to paint then, and where you're really more just doing kind of a breakup versus actually having to do a full paint job on it, especially with smaller pieces. Um, the other benefit is silicone is extremely elastic as well. Not quite as much as latex, but you can get some very high elasticity with silicones. Some have uh, like our dragon skin 10 up to a thousand percent, so you can get a very large elongation to it, so it works very well as prosthetics as well. You also have a wide range of hardnesses to that. Uh, so most silicones are rated on what's called the A scale. Um, this is just a hardness scale for gauging stuff like rubbers. Um, so you can have something very soft and pliable, like our Dragon Skin FX Pro that we'll be talking about today, that's a two shore A. Uh, works very well for prosthetics because it's easy to move, or say you were doing something like ear extensions, where you're doing a prosthetic for ears, and it had to be nice and long. Well, you want something a little bit stiffer. So something like our Dragon Skin 30 would be good for that because it's just a more uh, rigid material, so it won't flop around as much. And the other thing is, it's a faster application depending on which one you're using. So for something like the Skin Tight, where it's a three minute pot life and a uh, five minute cure time, you can do very thick and fast applications with that because you have three minutes to work with it and in five minutes, no matter how thick you are, it's gonna be set. So that's the nice thing about it is no matter how thick you go, you don't have to wait for it to dry. So it does help with that. However, with being able to go as thick as you want, um, some of the things you do need to be mindful of, the pieces are heavier. You don't have that same loss of a the moisture like you do with latex, so it's all still there. So you can get fairly heavy pieces, especially if you're sculpting pieces that are gonna be applied. Um, I've worn makeup myself personally, I've had actors that have worn makeup, and if you go very heavy and very thick with your silicone prosthetics uh, because of the character design, um, it can be very taxing on that actor to wear for a full day. So it's just something to keep in mind when working with them. Uh, and of course, silicones are more expensive, um, they're not like latex that can easily be harvested uh, from those trees and then processed. There's a little bit more that goes into silicones, especially with them having to be skin safe. So they, are, they do tend to be more expensive. Also, they are harder to seam. So unlike latex where you can kind of feather out your edges fairly easily, um, silicone, when you scrape it out or put it into a mold, you get more of a film. So it's more of a harder line. So it does take a little bit more work to seam out that so it blends very nicely in, but it's very easy and doable. All right, so from here, we're gonna discuss pigmenting. So again, 
biggest benefit of silicone is it's translucent. We don't want to lose that translucency, so we want to be able to pigment our silicone properly. So for this, the main way we're going to do that is with something like Silk Pig, and we have three ones here. We have a light flesh tone, medium flesh tone, and a dark flesh tone. And here I have some examples of what those look like here. So this is going to be our light, and you can see we get a little bit darker with our medium, and then we have our dark flesh tone. These I like to think of as bases. Um, I, typically, you're not going to find someone that matches these perfectly. If you get lucky, good for you, um, but typically there's usually some kind of underlying undertone, uh, and that undertone is basically, um, whether it's like an olive skin tone, if you've heard someone refer to that, if there's a little bit of a green undertone to that, that's going to be showing through. That's that olive. Or if someone has rosy skin, um, you have more of that red coming through. So it's just something to kind of keep in mind when working with someone. Um, so with that, these will be used as our bases. Um, for today, what we'll be doing is we'll be modifying it with some other silk pigs. And for that, I have seven colors here that we'll be using for modifying these. And we have black, blood, blue, brown, green, white, and yellow. So these are just smaller containers. I don't need as much, especially if I'm going to be putting something into like my makeup kit that I'm going to be taking with me. I don't want the a whole bunch of four ounce containers it just isn't necessary. Um, for today, we'll be doing a build up from a light skin tone to a dark skin tone. And we're going to be using the light flesh tone. The reason we'll be doing this is a very nice way for one, keeping something in your makeup kit or just in general if you're starting out, is having the nine pack sampler for our silk pigs. And that contains uh, our blood, our light flesh tone brown, black, green, blue, yellow, red, and white. Uh, we, I'm not going to be showing red today. I find the red is a bit too vibrant for actual skin tones. Uh, it, it just doesn't look natural to me. It, it's too bright. It wouldn't be something that you would typically find in the body. Um, if you're doing stage makeup, though, that may be something you want to look at. Uh, if you're doing something that needs to be very uh, gory as far as having a very bright red, as part of the makeup. Uh, the red, it works very well for that. I know with theatrical makeup, I've done a few myself, you need to have it be a little bit more exaggerated so it can be seen far away from the stage. So something like that will work great, uh, but as far as doing stuff close up or on camera, um, you're gonna want something a little bit more natural. And again, that blood works a lot better than just having that red. So here, we're gonna take some of that skin tight I pre-dispensed out, and we'll be using the flesh tone, again, that light flesh tone, and then adding to it. So I have two ounces of A and two ounces of B here. We'll be using that as our base for both. And I'm just going to put some gloves on because I am working with the pigments, and until they're mixed in, they can get kind of messy, so I don't want them to get all over myself. Yes. Somebody had a question about adding flocking to the silicone and, you know, how that would go uh, if you wanted to add that to kind of break up the surface. Okay. Um, so someone asked about flocking. Flocking is a type of filler that you can add in. Uh, typically very fine, um, comes in a variety of colors, and flocking gives the benefit of getting a natural breakup inside your silicone. So when you guys are gonna see me do here as far as coloration, you're gonna notice that it's one color. I'm throwing multiple colors in to create kind of some depth, but it's still a solid color. So what flocking does is it breaks up uh, the surface a bit. So that way when you're looking at it, you actually need to do even less painting because there's something underneath. Flocking comes in colors like red, blue, brown, yellow, green, a whole bunch of variety of colors. Anything that I have here, you can typically find in flocking, and it's just very fine little bits of, it's almost like wool, kind of. Uh, do be mindful, though, adding too much flocking uh, will thicken in your silicone. So if you're trying to pour that into a mold, it does make it thicker. 
Uh, and one other thing to kind of keep in mind is I wouldn't c try just coloring with flocking. I would still create a base color and then add flocking into it as that breakup. I've used flocking before in the past and it does a great job of that, um, but it isn't necessary. Um, but also another thing to just have in your tool belt. All right, so like I said before, we're gonna start with our light flesh tone. So I'm just gonna dab a little bit in there. I'm gonna set this to the side. So I don't like to just toss out any of my sticks that I use for uh, getting out and applying in my pigment. Uh, because if I need to do any adjustments, I like having that there to just change it up a little bit. So here we go, we have kind of a base there for just what that light flesh tone looks at a little bit of higher concentration than even what was in there. So you can see it kind of has a more of a warm kind of tan orangey look. We're gonna tone that down with a little bit of the silk pig blue. You're actually gonna see this lighten up very quickly. One thing to keep in mind, these are very potent. So you wanna use a tiny bit. I like using toothpicks because I don't want to add too much because you can very easily overpower it. Also, not all of these are the same concentration. Uh, the amount of yellow you're gonna have to add is not gonna be the same amount of blue. So don't think it is a one-to-one -one across the board. You wanna adjust per color. So again, just using a toothpick here, I'm just gonna add a dab in there and just kinda, again, just set this off to the side. So just that little bit of dab of that blue, you're gonna see it actually can overpower it a lot. Might add a little bit too much there. So like I said, very potent. We're kinda graying this out. So again, this is why I said I keep these. And we're gonna add just a tad bit more of that flesh back in. All right, there we go. So you can see that that just took away that bright orange that we're getting there. That's more of a tan skin tone and gave us more of a base. So just, again, just a little bit. Again, blue is very potent, so you do want to be mindful of that. If our person had a olive skin tone, we would want to add a little bit of green to it. Again, a little bit goes a long way. Uh, you can, again, same thing that happened with that blue where we overpowered it and it kind of started to almost gray out. We can do the same with the green, it becomes green. So one little drop of the green there will do the trick. And then just give that a mix. A little bit too much on the green but we can counteract that with a little bit of our blood. A lot of this is color theory and knowing uh, complementary colors. So green will knock it down red and red will knock down green. Yellow will kind of knock down that blue. White will just lighten. So you can see it's gonna take away that green more in there. And there we go. So now we have much more of a skin tone. Could use a little bit more blood. Just to bring some warmth back into it. So now we just have a slight green undertone to this. So that's more of our nice kind of olive skin. But say we wanted to go a little bit darker um, for that. We can break out our silk pig brown. I typically don't use brown by itself if I'm going for a darker skin tone. I find it, it makes it too flat. I like still like having a flesh tone base and usually mixing in some of the silk pig blood to open that up a bit. Just to add a little bit more depth. So then again, just adding that in. And you just can keep adding more as much as you need. You can do up to a 3%. I wouldn't recommend going that high though. One thing you wanna, again, you wanna retain that translucency. So if we add too much, we're gonna lose it. 
So we're starting to kind of hit that point. I can look at this visually and kind of tell that. However, if you're not used to figuring out your translucency just by looking at your silicone, a very handy trick is to take a magic marker or uh, any type of black marker, really. Get yourself a popsicle stick and just put a dot on it. I usually do like a pea-sized dot on there. And basically what this is doing is it allows me to gauge that translucency a little bit better. So I pull my silicone up, hold it at an angle, and then I let it run off. And I'm looking for how soon I can see that black dot. So I don't really want to add too much more to this. We are getting close. Um, one thing to keep in mind is we are going to be thinning this out with a whole nother one part. So this will lighten back up. So we can still add a little bit more in here. But if you notice here, I'm also paying attention to how much silicone is on my stick because I want to see the actual thickness of it because my makeup, however thick that I'm planning on making it, that's where I want to see that translucency through. So right now we have a little bit about like an eighth inch. So this is probably fine. We're going to add a little bit more brown in here just to make it a little bit darker. Hey, Greg, how much of that material do you have measured out in that cup? Measure out in this cup, right? At, uh, someone just asked how much material I have. Measure out in the cup right now is about two ounces worth of material. Um, for our, for anyone that is using the metric system, that is two ounces is going to be about a hundred and, sorry, not 110. Uh, let's see, it's because it's 118 for four ounces. About 58 milliliters, if I remember correctly. It's going to be approximately what it is. So we can add a little bit more on there. We'll probably have to brighten this up a little bit. And don't want to go too dark. We're going to add a little bit of red in here. And then possibly even some yellow just to get this a little bit brighter. Don't want to muddy things out too much. All right, there we go. So just need a little bit more red in there. And again, it's always good to have your model in front of you if you can when doing this. If not, you just want to have a good guideline for what kind of skin tone they're going to have or get close to it. All right. If this seems daunting and mixing a lot of different colors to get matching your skin tone, we do have another way of doing that. Um, but let's actually just quick add our part A for this. So this will be a total of four ounces worth of material here, just so you guys can kind of gauge how much pigment that actually is. It's very little in the scheme of things for it. There we go. Um, again, four ounces is going to be about uh, 118 milliliters for anyone that is used to using the metric system versus uh, the empirical system like here in the US. And if you need to do any last minute adjustments, you can, but I always recommend getting close with just one part before adding the other. You can always pigment both halves or you can just do this. So yeah, we can go a little bit darker here. So we're going to add a little bit more of that brown in. And then just give this a good mix, just to incorporate that fully, just to get the skin tone that we want. All right, so there's our skin tone. And we'll do a quick test with our stick to see how we are on our translucency. That's not bad. So with that, again, we can see right about there, that's when we're starting to see the dot, which is perfect. It's a good eighth inch there. Um, I like keeping my makeup thin. Uh, if you go too thick, um, one, it can become harder to move. You don't necessarily need to do it. So again, if this is very overbearing as far as trying to mix all these colors, 
there is one other option, and that's the Fuse FuseFX pigment line uh, sold by Reynolds Advanced Materials. Uh, they're one of our distributors. Uh, you can also find them at other uh, places as well, but I know the Reynolds do carry these. Let me just move these off to the side quick. And again, we will be using two ounces of A and two ounces of B. And for that, we have, again, that Fuse Effects pigment line. So they have a full line that goes from very light skin, which they call porcelain, to their darkest skin that they call dark. Um, this is their S series. Um, this is just a wide range of skin tones. So it has variations on shades where you have something like, you can see here it says warm tan. So there is a tan and a warm tan. So it's that tan color with a little bit extra of that red showing through for it. Rosy is kind of like their medium skin tone with, again, more of that red showing through. Olive, of course, has that green showing through. So a very easy way of adjusting them and also getting close to your model's skin tone without having to do all that mixing. Um, they are a little bit more expensive, I'll let you know that right now, but the nice thing about them is you don't really have to uh, guess at your colorations. These have exact formulas to them. On each of these bottles, they will have a little direction here that say shake well, and then it's gonna tell you to add uh, two or three or however many it is for that particular pigment. Each of these does, does have a different ratio, and it's per 10 grams of silicone uh, by weight. So you do need to know the weight of it. Just to give everyone a ballpark idea, the silicone that I have measured out right now, here, that four ounces or 118 milliliters, is roughly about 100 grams of silicone. Uh, so for this, let's do that warm tan I was talking about. And for this one, it's three drops per 10 grams of platinum silicone. So for this, what we're gonna do is we'll dispense our B in first. Again, this is off of the total weight of the material. So for this, we'll be adding in, um, for this, since we're doing 100 grams, we'll divide that by 10, since it's per 10 grams of silicone, and then times that by three, so we'll do 30 drops. Um, that may sound like a lot, um, but in the schemes of what's in this bottle, it's very little. So I'm just gonna give this a good shake. Uh, these, again, as I kind of like pre-mixed all my pigments before, same thing with this. Pre-mix them, pigments are heavy, they will settle out. So we wanna make sure that we aren't just getting the medium that they're in, we wanna get the pigment as well. So here we're just gonna add 30 drops. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep. The one downside of these is the little ball that's in there for shaking does get stuck. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty. There we go. So don't fully turn these upside down, leave them a little bit on the side. It'll help. And then We'll just mix this in. So this may seem a little bit on the dark side, but again, these are formulated to work with the full batch of silicone. So once I add in my part A, this is going to lighten back up. So again, just a very easy way to get your skin tones without having to worry about mixing a whole bunch of different colors. As you'll see later, um, I actually did some uh, experimenting and testing to make sure I got a good skin tone for Heather. Um, and so I'm using five different pigments to get her skin tone. So with this, you can get a fairly close one without having to do that. Uh, you can actually mix these as well. So if you need something that's an in-between for your model or actor, where one isn't quite right, but you don't want to use something that's too light or too dark, you can combine them to get into kind of an in-between. I'll show that in a second. So here we have that nice translucency. I'll grab another dot, 
stick here in a second so you guys can see what this looks like. Just want to make sure I get a good mix here. So again, we're just going to put a dot on here just to check our translucency. This will help you guys kind of see what these look like. If you find that these are too dark for you, you can always add less from what they recommend. Right there. So again, you can start seeing the dot show through there. So that's perfect. That's that nice translucency. That's kind of where you want it. You kind of want to start seeing that dot come through about an eighth of an inch of silicone on your stick. Um, that's what I aim for. However, uh, th that's my opinion. Um, if you ask other makeup artists, some will tell you lighter, some will tell you darker, um, because that's what they like working with. Um, it is personal preference, so it's everyone does have their own preference as to what they use. Um, this is just mine. This is my own personal preference. This is the translucency I shoot for for doing my makeup, because I like it. Um, so if it's not quite right, don't freak out. You can make it work for that. All right. So now that we've done some pigmentation and going through how to pigment our silicone, we'll have Heather come on now, and we'll do some direct skin application with some silicone. Thank you, Heather. So one thing I always do recommend with models is making sure that they do have clean skin. Um, so no lotions, no foundations, none of that. Um, that type of stuff can inhibit, if you're using silicone, can inhibit your silicone, so you do want to be mindful of that. Um, also, it can cause uh, adhesion issues of the silicone actually sticking to the skin properly if there's any too much oil. Uh, so if your model does uh, have makeup on, I just like using some baby wipes that are just plain baby wipes that don't have any aloe or vitamin E in them just to kind of clean the skin beforehand just to get a nice easy to use clean surface. If for some reason you do not have those, makeup wipes work as well. I just find that certain makeup wipes have too much uh, oils in them to help remove the makeups as well as condition the skin after makeup's been removed. So again, can just make it tough to get it on there. All right, so for this, we're gonna be using Skin Tight. This is the, what we just mixed up. And it's a one-to-one -one by volume. For this, this is our four ounce size. So what we can do is we can dispense these at the same time to get uh, the same volume. Uh, and then here we have in the yellow our A, and in the blue is our B. Um, all our materials come in two parts. Um, other than Dermatac, Dermatac is a one component that we'll be showing today. Uh, it's a single component adhesive, but we'll get to that later. All right, so for this, I'm gonna be using two fuse effects, because again, did some checking, and Heather is a combination of our light skin tone in the fuse effects plus our olive. I'm using these because it's personal preference as well as because I'm combining both of these at once, I wanna get that color mixed in very quickly. So let me just take the caps off of here. And then we'll get these dispensed. All right. So again, we're gonna be dispensing these at the same time so we get an even amount. And I just want to gauge how much there is. And that's a good amount right there. Okay. All right. And then for this, let me just give these a quick shake. We're gonna do two light, two, and then one olive. I found that worked for getting a nice close. One thing that I like doing is I like to cover my pigment with the silicone before I start mixing so it doesn't get absorbed uh, into my mixing stick so I don't lose any of it. So before we go apply, we can just bring this up to Heather and check. I say that's a good match there. All right, so you can see that this is very runny. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some Thyvex. This is a liquid thickener that comes with our four ounce skin tight, just to make it a little bit thicker. 
Um, usually I say about five drops per ounce. For this, so for this, we'll do three drops. One, two, and three. And then give this just a good mix. So you can see that it's starting to get thicker already. I'm also going to do a quick little double mix and pour here just to make sure I don't have any unmixed material going on Heather. I don't want it to stay tacky on her. So we're going to put this in a nice clean container and then give it another good mix. Again, just give that a little mix. Thidex does take a second to kind of start working, so don't panic if it's not thickening right away. You gotta give it a second. You can see that it's already gotten thicker there. You can do, I'll say, one more drop in here, just so I get a nice consistency on this. There we go, one drop. And then just give that a good mix. Again, give it a second to start taking effects. You don't want to add too much of the 5X because it can prevent the silicone from curing properly if you add too much. So here we have this nice kind of paste right now. So this is really good for applying. Uh, personal preference is I do not use the same stick I was mixing with because it can have unmixed material on it. So I always get a fresh one. Um, for this, I'm going to be actually taking one of my tools um, and applying it to Heather. You do not need uh, fancy tools like these. This is just personal preference uh, that I've built up over the years as far as what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of create the body of the wound here. And once I get the general shape that I want, I'm going to wipe off my tool just to get rid of that excess silicone from it. And then I can go in and I can take it and I can scrape and shape this. Kind of feather it out. Any excess that I don't need, I get off. Probably could have used a little bit less for this. And we can just kind of feather this down and back. We have about three minutes to work with it. So we'll just do that. Just to show you guys you don't need fancy tools like this, I'm actually just gonna grab a popsicle stick that I actually just kind of took down here and show you that you can just come in and just go in there and shape it. This will set up in about five minutes. So for now this, I'm gonna go into the center here and add my cut. Since this is a cut, I'm not going to do any crazy jagged motions or anything. Um, cuts are clean if it's a sharp blade. Uh, if it's not, then yeah, then you might want to, to do some jaggedness to it. Uh, the sharper the blade, the cleaner the cut, so it's just something to kind of keep in mind. And then, as you can see, it's starting to pull a little bit. So I'm just going to grab one of my other tools, and I'm going to grab a little spray bottle of isopropyl alcohol. Um, this is just acts as a lubricant, just so that the silicone doesn't stick to my tool and I can take it and feather it out. Oop, hitting that point. I don't wanna move it too much now, but I will peel back some of that center just to open this piece up in here. You gotta be careful because if you mess with it too much, you can start lifting up edges. So here I'm just kind of opening up the wound with this. So as you can see, this is already nice and fairly set already for how thick this is. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix up a little bit more skin tight and add in that blood pigment that we talked about and then put that in there. So we'll bring out the silk pig blood. Just get that ready. Again, toothpick. And make some stick. All right. We won't need as much for this one because we're just doing a smaller amount. And for this, we're not going to thicken it. We're going to just leave it in its regular consistency. And just again, just give this a little squirt. We don't need a lot. 
I'm gonna make sure that these are even. All right, so we have a nice even size there. You only need to use as much as you can work with. So you don't wanna go overboard with it. A little pigment there. And then again, since we're gonna be going very thin with this, I'm gonna be adding more. So again, something to just kind of keep in mind is how much you're actually going to be using or how much pigment you need to use. So if you're doing very thin sections, you need to add more pigment into your mix so it has the correct transparency to it. So that's why I was saying where I'm like gauging off of an eighth of an inch because as you can see here, I have that wound at the highest point a little bit over eighth of an inch. So that's where I'm aiming for as far as how much that goes. So th since this is such a small amount, it makes it very hard to do a double mix. So we're just gonna make sure that we're scraping the side and scraping the bottom really well to get a good mix in here. All right. I'm just gonna set that down. And then I'm gonna be using uh, this tool here. Uh, it just has a little bit of a lip to it. Uh, I like it because I can kind of take my material and just work it into that center of the wound. Uh, straight skin tight, I typically treat for uh, small abrasions, small cuts, nothing too large for the most part, unless it just needs to be done once and I have the time to. Uh, but if I need to do a makeup really quick, um, I'll usually do a pre-made but here we can just throw that in there. Again, if you want to darken up, you could add some brown, you could add some black. And since this is a little bit flat, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a, a sponge. Uh, they're like coarse sponge. I'm not sure where, what exactly they're called. Just ones that I have in my kit. They're just nice and broken up so I can take my silicone and dab it over the makeup. And it, goes on as a broken up pattern already. So that's, that's why I like using these is because they're already broken up and it kind of matches the natural breakup that you would see on the face anyway. It's always good to have, always have some form of reference on me at all times um, if I'm doing makeup just so I know what it looks like, whether it's from my own test reference, so I have that, or from different uh, photos of wounds that I've either taken pictures of personally. Um, so whenever I get a cut or something, I'll take a photo of it. Or if I know people that get injured, I'd be like, hey, I heard you got this injury. Can I get a photo of that? Um, ask your friends, don't ask strangers. Um, strangers will find it weird. Your friends will support you. Um, Greg, have you ever used like a, uh, a texture pad or anything like that on the uncured silicone to kind of bring back like poor texture? Jason's asking if I've ever used a texture pad to bring back uh, some like uh, poor texture. Um, I have, I've done that. Uh, you have to time it right though. Uh, you have to wait till the silicone's almost fully set and then you need a good amount of alcohol on there to make sure that it doesn't stick. Um, even like a sponge like this will work for that. Um, I know guys that will do the whole thing and then they'll go back in with like skin tight or even, a, or even just straight adhesive with a sponge like this or a broken up sponge just to add some texture back into the piece itself. Um, definitely doable, takes practice for getting the correct timing for it though. If you do it too soon, you just make a mess uh, where you need to kind of wait uh, about where I was touching it, where it was starting to pull, that's about where you need to do it with a lot of kind of alcohol on your texture pad. Uh, very tricky to do, but definitely is doable. All right, thank you, Heather. We're gonna let this set up. Like I said, it takes about five minutes to set, but it's pretty much set there. What I have in the cup here is good to go. Uh, the one thing that I do like about metal tools versus like wooden tools like this is silicone really sticks to these. Sometimes they don't come off. So they can end up being damaged, where with these guys, once the silicone's set, I can just rub off any of that. So, and of course, if you are reusing tools, make sure you are cleaning and sanitizing them after use um, when switching in between models. 
You don't want to be using the same tool without cleaning it on someone else. Always use proper hygiene. Um, as far as me wearing gloves, uh, I just didn't take them off after I was mixing up all that silicone with all that pigment. Um, is it necessary? These are skin safe, so if they got on my skin, it's not a problem. Um, however, I will still wear gloves uh, for doing a lot of stuff because if I do need to, if I do make a mess and I have it all over my hands, instead of having to clean my hands off, I can just take my gloves off and I'll be fine. All right. Well, let's set this stuff to the side and change our sheet of paper here. All right. And I'll change my gloves at this point, too. So next, we're going to have actually making a wound plate. So say you don't have a lot of time to uh, either do the makeup on set that needs to be a very quick application, or it's something that's just going to be uh, very detailed. Um, that you don't want to be trying to do in just straight skin tight. Um, because it isn't like sculpting with clay, there is a different feel to it. So for this, what we have here is a wound that I sculpted on just some plastic. Uh, the base that you use for sculpting, you can really use a lot of different stuff. Um, I like using more rigid materials like this plastic or melamine or um, even tiles, like if you go out and get floor tiles, people like using those, I know some people that do that, or even like acrylic. Um, you can use foam core. Uh, I stopped using it though because I did find um, I was getting some issues with my edges um, that when I was thinning them out, I was dis dis uh, displacing the foam underneath, so I was getting a dimple and I wasn't getting good edges on my pieces. So I switched to something that's very nice and ridges, so I get that nice edge for it. So for this, this is the Chavant NSP Hard that I mentioned earlier. I like using this because I like having a very hard material for my clay. It holds detail really well, um, and that way I can get very fine without losing it. The other thing I like about it is it breaks down very easily with isopropyl alcohol. So when I'm using my sculpting tools, which I'll show you guys here what my set looks like, I just have a, I have more than this, but this is my main set that I use. So I have a whole range here um, from wooden tools to silicone tip tools to a bunch of different metal tools to different types of rakes. Um, you don't need all these. These are things I've collected over the years of my sculpting that I like. Um, my rakes are my favorite tools, just what I use. Some people don't like using them. Some people will go other routes. So find what works best for you. This is just what I like using. So one thing that always happens is whenever I'm sculpting, tools have very hard edges. So I need to soften those up because organic stuff doesn't have hard edges for the most part. There's very few things in nature that do. Um, and it's just because of the nature of things grow outward. So they round, they round off. So because of that, you need to soften those. So I like being able to just take one of those brushes that I have in my kit with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol, go over top, and it gives it a nice, thin, softer edge to it. So for this, we need to make a mold of this so we can cast silicone into it. So what we're going to do is we're just going to use some of the uh, Sculptex hard. I have these cut into strips. Uh, these are about half inch uh, tall. And I like using these because I can just kind of flex it around the piece. So since wounds are very irregular, I don't want to be wasting a lot of material on building a piece that is just going to be a block. I don't want to just build a block around this. There's a lot of excess material there. So by having the clay, I can just go around, press it down, and get about a quarter inch all the way around, just enough to give me a nice area to squeegee my silicone off of. And then we'll just take this other piece here and flex it around. Uh, let's see adjust this a little bit. Go a little bit further out if we want to. All right, so this needs to come out a little bit right there. Okay, and then we can bring this side in. And basically we're just going to shift this to get a nice even thickness all the way around. And clay is nice because I can flex it to get the shape I need. There we go. Okay. I might actually need to cut this one second here. 
Yep, it's a little bit long. So let me just grab a sculpting tool really quick. And I can just give this a quick chop. There we go. Bring that in. There. OK. So now we have our retaining wall for pouring our resin into. Uh, you don't have to use resin. I'll be using the Smoothcast 300 today. Uh, however, you can use plaster. Uh, you can use something like the Dual Matrix Neo. Anything that is rigid uh, does work. Um, so for this, I'm just going to quick seal up any edges with my tool and just run around the outside just to, again, just to seal that up. We don't want any of that resin leaking out. If you are using something like plaster, though, just keep in mind you do need to seal that. Um, you could use something like our Super Seal, um, or you could do the old makeup artist trick of thinning out some Vaseline with some mineral spirits and brushing a few coats of that onto your plaster. And that'll do the same thing. You're just looking to seal up the porosity of the plaster. So uh, the silicone doesn't work its way into the pores and gets stuck. All right, so now that we sealed up the inside of this, there we go. We'll also do the same thing to the outside. Just give this a quick press down just to make sure that we're not getting any leaks. You know, again, nothing fancy. You could do all this with a popsicle stick if you wanted to. Um, I'm just using the tools that I have at my disposal. All right, so like I said before, for this we'll be using our Smoothcast 300. And for this, I'm going to put gloves on because this is not a skin safe material. And first thing we're going to do, because we don't want this to stick and not be able to come off is we're going to apply a little release for this. So that's going to be our universal mold release for this. And we're just going to give it a quick little spray. Actually, one second here. Let me just brush out some clay chips there. And just give this a quick spray. Don't go too close. And then I'm just going to take a chip brush and softly go around, just kind of working in all the details, just to make sure that it's fully coated. Don't want anywhere that isn't. This is going to make releasing easier. Uh, if you want to, you can seal your clay. That can help with clean out. Uh, and for that, I would just use a clear acrylic spray. Uh, personally, I don't, because uh, I like to I find that if I try salvaging my clay afterwards, after it's been sprayed, uh, it messes with it a little bit. So I don't do that. I'll just take the time to clean it. And just another light spray over top. So this flashes off very quickly. It means that all the gases uh, leave the system fast um, and any of the solvents. So now we're just going to measure this out. So with these, um, with all our materials, you'll see the stir well or shake well on the lids. Uh, these are fluid enough that I can just give them a good shake and it'll be fine. And for this, we'll be doing uh, two ounces of A, two ounces of B. Again, Bs are going to be in your blue containers. You can remember B for blue um, as a general rule of thumb. And we're always going to want to pigment our part B. So just give this a quick dispense. There again, just two ounces. Part A. Make sure that you, if you are using the same blade to open these up, give it a good wipe. You don't want to cause any cross-contamination by getting uh, one part into the other, because that can ruin your batch. and then dispensing our part A. All 
All right, there we go. So now we have equal amounts. We'll dispense our part B into our cup here. Um, for mixing stuff like resins, I like going with a little bit taller on the cup because it is more fluid, helps with any splashing that may occur while I'm mixing, just helps keep it in the cup. But mixing my silicones, I do like using the smaller containers. The only difference I'm changing sizes here. All right, for this, just to help you guys kind of see everything that's on camera, um, we're going to add a little bit of the So Strong Black. This isn't ne necessary, this is just for the camera. Um, however, if you do want to color code your molds, which can be helpful sometimes if you're doing a lot of castings, um, you can color code them by adding a little bit of So Strong to them if you're using the resins. So we'll just add two drops there. Come on. There we go. So if you want to color code, you can, but it's not necessary. I'll just give this a quick stir. So Smoothcast 300 is a bright white resin. So that means once we mix this, this black will turn to a gray. All right, now that we have a good mix there, we'll add in our part A and give this a good mix. For this, we're gonna be doing a double mix and pour just to ensure that we have a good thorough mix on our piece. Again, scraping the sides, scraping the bottom. And get all that out of our one container and then just give us another mix. Uh, for this, we have about three minutes of working time. So just kind of keep that in mind. This does go fairly quickly. So if you're doing a larger piece, you may want to go with a slower setting one, like the Smoothcast 305 has a little bit more pot life to it. So if it, for this, we're just gonna pick one spot and pour and let it seek its own level. This will help with ensuring that it goes through and we don't entrap any air because we want a very accurate reproduction of our sculpture that we spent the time to make. And just top that off. So something like a wound plate doesn't have to be really big. Um, they only need to be about quarter inch to half inch thick. Uh, also the bubbles on the back, I'm just gonna quick give them a quick break here. Uh, reason I'm doing that is just to make sure I get a nice flat surface for when I'm pouring. So just get to those and pop them as I can. Grab that, and I dropped. So we're not gonna move this until it changes, just because we don't want to disturb our surface. All right, so I'm just going to just slide this off to the side here. There we go. So after your resin has set, you'll have a mold that looks like this, that has clay typically stuck to it. So for this, some of it will stay. So like you can see here that some of it didn't peel off, others did, other parts did. So we're just gonna take a sculpting tool. So this one will work fine and you'll just work on peeling out that clay. So you're just gonna go through and peel out. If you're concerned about damaging and you're not sure how much pressure to put down, a wooden tool sometimes is better so you don't damage uh, the mold itself. And then you'll just keep working at it until you get it down to just a thin layer of clay. Again, don't want to lose this, so I'm just going to set this here. We're not going to clean out this whole thing. Uh, not a fun process to watch. However, I will show you guys a little bit, like basically what the next step is going to be for this. And that would be, so like for an area over here where we don't have as much um, clay, what we can do is we can take a little bit of ISO, uh, whether it's just in a cup or in a spray bottle like I have here, both ways work. And we're just going to give that a quick little spray and then just take 
this, and you're just going to go through and just work it out. So you can see here that this is now cleaning that out. And if you need to, you can wipe off the excess and then come back in and pull it out. And you'll do that for the entire mold. So you'll get a nice clean mold, which will end up looking like this. So this is what that mold actually looks like. You guys can see that there. Um, that's nice and clean. However, you can notice that there is a little bit of residue over the mold. You can see that brown there. Um, that's fine. It's not going to hurt it. Um, typically, I account for my first mold, my first piece that I pull out of a mold like this as kind of uh, waste, just for the fact that they typically have a thin film of that clay on them still. So it, you, when you pull it out, it'll kind of get waxy. So just kind of something to keep in mind is if you pull that first one out and it isn't perfect and the surface looks weird, that's probably what it is. The next one after that should be fine. It's usually that first one that once you do it, it'll come out and you're fine. So here you can, guys can see now, this is turned that gray, so it's turned from that black to that gray because of that color change. So we're just gonna let this sit and I'll show you guys what this mold looks like cleaned. So you'll have a mold that will look like this. Oops, got a little bit of clay on there. Let's get that off. So you'll have a mold that will look like this. So everything that was raised is now depressed. Everything that was depressed is now raised. So it's just creating that negative. So next we'll cast into this. And for that, I'm actually going to bring out a few extra wound plates. So both of these would be considered just singular wound plates here, just one. Um, so just one, that's perfectly fine if that's all you need. Or you can do uh, like a gang mold wound plate where you have multiple wounds on one plate. But this can be done for a number of reasons. This can just be done for efficiency. Um, if you just need to be making a lot of pieces at once. Um, if you're doing something that is a progressive makeup, where you are gonna be doing a healing process of the wound. Um, having them all on one plate can be very handy, so you're no, you don't have five molds that you need to find. You have one mold that you can just pour into for all those pieces. Makes it a little bit more efficient, makes it a little bit nicer. Um, or you can just, again, have it so you have a whole bunch and produce a lot at once. Because pre-made silicone mold pieces can be stored and saved. So you can use them down the line uh, at a later date, as long as you make sure you store them properly with some talc in a nice Ziploc bag and keep them clean. All right, so for this, we're gonna be pouring in some uh, Dragon Skin FX Pro, like I mentioned earlier. So this is, again, another one-to-one -one by volume. Uh, this is a very common one used for prosthetics. Uh, because of just how soft it is. Like I said, it's a too short A, so it's very soft. Um, so it works very well for that. So same thing as before, we're gonna give these a good mix. So you always wanna do this with all your materials. So we're gonna mix our part B, and then we'll mix our part A. And just scrape off any excess so we don't lose that. We always want to do this. If you don't, you can end up having your material not set up on you, which you don't want, especially with your silicones, because like we mentioned before, they are on the more expensive side, so we don't want to be wasting that. We want to be preserving that cost. All right. So same thing as before. Oops. Containers here. And there we go. So we'll dispense this out. On. And then same thing with the part A, we're gonna give this a quick mix. If you wanted something even softer than the Dragon Skin FX Pro, we do have another line called EcoFlex, and, and that falls on what's called the double ot scale or the zero zero scale. Very soft. Um, if any of you are familiar with silicone masks, 
Um, a lot of those are typically silicones that are something like our EcoFlex double lot 30 or our EcoFlex double lot 20. Um, very soft, so that way, no matter how kind of thick the piece is, it can still emote or show emotion very well for the actor that's wearing an, it underneath. Again, just give this a good mix and scrape. Don't want to waste any of it. All right, and then we'll dispense out again, even parts. Again, this is just a one-to-one -one by volume. Uh, most of, actually, all of our skin-safe silicones are one-to-one -one by volume. So that's the nice thing about them. You don't need a scale for it. Uh, the only time I really recommend a scale when using uh, like this type of material is if you're doing one, either a very small amounts or if you're trying to get consistent pigmentation. If you want that consistent pigmentation, it's good to weigh out your pigments. So just give me one second. I have a little cheat sheet over here for the formula that I'm using on here. So we'll need our light flesh, our blood, our green, our white, and our yellow. For it. All right, so we'll dispense this into a larger container here. Just to give us more room to mix since these are so close to the top. And since I have a formula, I don't need to add these in little by little, but if you're trying to figure out your colors, I do recommend adding a little bit at a time for it, like we were doing earlier, where we're just adding a little bit of this, a little bit of that, until you get the color that you want. And then if you are doing what I'm going to be showing you guys here is uh, what I call the drop method, is just adding a little bit of pigment with drops. Um, you want to kind of kind of keep in mind how many you're adding so you can get a consistency if you need to do that. So for this, it will be eight drops of flesh. Also keep in mind how much material that you're mixing. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And again, same as before, I'm gonna save these just in case uh, because this is more inconsistent than weight. So if for some reason one drop does end up being larger than what it's supposed to be and I need to correct that coloration, I want to have those colors on hand to fix that. Hey, Greg, you don't need a release agent then when you pour into these molds? Yes. Uh, someone just asked if we need a release agent for pouring into our urethane molds uh, that we have here. The answer is no. We don't need a release agent. Silicone really doesn't like to stick to most things, um, so we don't need to worry about that. So we can just pour directly in there without any release. Um, if you were doing a silicone mold into, like pouring silicone into a silicone mold, then yes, you would need a release agent for that. I know some people that they like having a silicone mold for their pieces. Um, if you're going to do that, I do recommend, one, two, three, four, um, what I recommend doing is uh, isopropyl alcohol, about 91, 99%, um, at two parts and then one part dish soap. Uh, because this will be a makeup that's going on someone's skin, so we don't want to be using anything like the Ease Release 200 for that. Um, so for an instance like that, I usually go with that. Um, again, personal preference here, I typically go with rigid molds if I'm doing a flat open back mold like this. Um, and I'll use a rigid mold for a lot of my makeup pieces just because it gets me cleaner edges, at least I feel it does of the blood. One, two, three, four, five, six. When working in larger batches, weighing definitely does make things easier, but again, isn't necessary. If you're using some, like I said, if you're doing something like a plaster, um, you also don't need a release as long as it's sealed properly. If it's not sealed properly, then that can become troublesome. Um, so again, I would still stick with that isopropyl and dish soap. Um, but again, not necessary uh, for the most part, as long as everything's non-porous. One, two, two, and three. There we go. 
and four drops of yellow. So it's always good to prep for doing stuff on set. That's the nice thing about doing the pre-made ones. And again, as far as movies, if you're going to be on film, two, three, four, it's kind of a half one there. Um, you want consistency um, when you're doing shot the shot, so you want things to look the same. So this is going to kind of look like a big mess at first, but once we get all the pigments in there, they'll start to come together. So you've got to scrape those sides really well to get any of that off, anything that might be on the stick. There we go, that's lighting up. Might need to add a little bit more white in here. Just to tone this down a little bit, it's a little dark. Yeah, something, something was a little heavy in here, so we'll do a little bit of extra white in here and an extra flesh and a little extra yellow. So this is why we're not going to combine our A and B right away, so we have some time to correct, correct this stuff. All right, we can use that. So that's what I was saying by weighing is the best thing. This is not quite the color I was going for. It still works as a skin tone, just not what I was aiming for. But we can use this, so no issue there. So always tricky when doing that drop message because every drop does not end up being the same size. Um, so you do have some inaccuracies where you do have to do the adjustments. So weighing is always the best way if you want a very accurate color each time. It just becomes very hard when working in very small batches like this. All right. So again, we're going to be adding our A and B together and giving this a good mix with scraping the sides and scraping the bottom for it. As far as when it comes to actually scraping these, we want to make sure we have a nice thin edge. Uh, thin edges blend easier into the face. Uh, so we want to make sure that we clean them up nice and neat um, before we walk away from them and let them set. All right. And then just give this a good mix. And just doing that double mix to make sure that I have thorough consistency uh, throughout my mix. All right, and then we're just going to pour this from a high point and just let it seek its own level and then go over to our next one and let that fill up. I'm giving these a little space to spread out as well so I'm not over uh, loading them too much because again I am going to be scraping. It looks like that one might need a little bit more. Uh, this amount actually is going to pretty much fill up everything when we get down to it. And then I'll start, start on these far ones here. And you'll see what I'm talking about once I start scraping this. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to fill all this, but once you actually get to it, and we actually get through. So we'll let that seek out. And then I'm going to grab a bunch of clean tongue depressors here for our scraping method. So for this, I'm going to kind of bring it down so it fills off this end here. Get to the end and then run this across. So you can see that a bunch of this came off that can then go into these here. Same thing with this, we're going to do on this side is fill in our wound. 
I'll flip the stick to make sure I have a nice clean edge. Take it, run it around, make sure I'm flowing in a direction to get everything filled. Any spots that I see that need to get filled, I'll kind of squeegee a little bit back in off my stick just to get them filled in and get those going. And just throw that into there. And then give these another pass really quick just to get really nice edges. Flipping. Again, too much silicone drags through the other silicone and it causes problems. So that's why you kind of want to go through and rotate through your sticks or have a good squeegee that you can clean off easily as you're going through. So you can see all that excess material that can now get squeegeed through the rest of these pieces. All right, so yeah, we'll just finish these off by just going over top of them, dispensing it over here so it can get a little bit. I'm gonna slide this one away so I don't dig into it and go across this one, this one, and this one. And we actually have some excess here that will happen. And then again, just go across. So we have nice thin edges on these guys. Anywhere that I see thick, I'll go back through and I'll just even do like just a side swipe on just the, those areas. Like right here, just give that a quick dig. Okay. So this now is starting to about set up. At this point, I'm really not gonna have much time to do anything else. If I do, I'm gonna start pulling, uh, which I don't wanna do. So let's dispose of our pigments. And we'll move these off to the side, trying not to disturb them too much. And we'll change our paper. So these will set up in about 40 minutes. The pot life for the FX Pro is 12 minutes, uh, right? Yes, 12 minutes. And if you are, if you're new, if you're working with a new material or anything like that, all our materials do come with technical bulletins. So you can look up all that information in there. Uh, and it gives you tips and tricks for working with the material also. All right, change my gloves. And now we have a piece that is cured. So let's, let's grab a piece that actually is set that's been cured already. So here we have, again, one of those squeegee pieces that I made earlier that, again, just open back mold. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take some talc powder, talcum powder, or baby powder works too. And we're just gonna give a nice little brush on the backside of this. Uh, you don't need to use a fancy brush for this. Uh, I know some people like using uh, like a powder puff or like a brush, a blush brush that has a very soft bristle to it. Um, to help with any thin sections so you're not like puncturing them and damaging them. I just use a chip brush, I find it works fine. And for me, I like actually having a little bit stiffer to work into areas that get stuck. So we'll just slowly peel up one side and just give it a little dab and just dab through it, taking any of that excess and we're doing this for two reasons as far as like having the talc powder or baby powder um, is the silicone will stick to itself. So if you don't do this, uh, the silicone edges will roll over and then they just uh, pill, like pill up. Um, so then you can't, it makes it harder to lay them down. And you just wanna slowly work this up. If you pull too hard on it, you're liable to rip the piece um, they do have very high elongation, but if you have a really thin section, um, you can tear that very easily. So again, just process of just going back and forth with the baby powder and the brush, doing a little tapping when it gets stuck just to break that surface tension. It's 
It's not that the silicone has bonded to the plastic, it's just silicone has a high surface tension, so you have to relieve that, which the baby powder does, by preventing it from sticking to itself, as well as help break the mold surface as well as it gets in there. So again, just slowly working, taking in the excess and just going over top for this. Um, if you're doing this and you do end up uh, tearing a piece, it's not the end of the world um, because as long as you can glue it back together when uh, you're applying it, so when you're putting it down, if you can just take a little bit of your adhesive in between them, you can get it to look like new if you need to. So don't panic too much about that if you get a slight tear. Uh, sometimes it's not even noticeable. Um, some people like also adding an extra lip, like uh, I had on a larger one, where silicone will go in and then it creates kind of a, a channel around. And they do that so they get a little bit better handling of the piece. Works really well for larger pieces. There we go. All right. All right, so give this just a final dust, dusting. So again, that was just one of those finished molds. And you can see here we have these nice thin edges that I was talking about that you want. You want it nice and thin so it's easier to blend. And you can, remember what I said, how it kind of uh, pills up over itself? You can see that happen right here where we have this. Um, so for that, you can do two things. If it's thin enough, you can typically just rip it. You can take an X-Acto, or you can take a pair of little scissors here and just give it a little, a little trim just to that. Even just adding a little neck. There we go. Um, I don't like doing large, long sections of straight cuts uh, because it's more noticeable on skin versus some, like the organic edge that we have here. All right, now that we have that demolded, let's have Heather come back over and we'll do some application. Move this out of the way. Me personally, I always clean off my pieces before I apply them. So, like I don't want it, so while I'm storing it, they're powdered, but once they're gonna be applied, I take a little bit of isopropyl alcohol again, just in a spray bottle, just give it a little spritz, and just take a brush and just go over and just help get rid of some of that excess powder. I do, do need to be careful though, because again, I got rid of the powder that's keeping it from sticking to itself. But I find it does help with um, not having a white or a muted color behind it from the powder. All right, so for this piece, we have a fatty center in here. So because of that, we need to be mindful of where this would be going. Um, so typically, again, this is where I was talking about like anatomy coming in handy, of knowing where certain things happen. Um, so upper arms, chest, back, thighs, those are typically your areas that are gonna have the more fatty tissue. So for something like this, that's where, really where it would go. Uh, fat does settle out elsewhere, uh, but typically when you get a wound, you don't see it as much in other places. Um, the face and head tend to be low on that. Forearms are fairly low as far as like your fat content. Um, but of course, everything will vary from person to person. These are just generalizations that you wanna kinda of keep in mind for it. So if you're doing something that's a wound on the arm or the hand uh, that, where you don't have that, you're typically going to see the muscle, you're going to see skin, and then you're going to see muscle. You're not going to see that fat that's over top that muscle. So for this next piece, we're just going to be mixing up some silicone. Just a little bit more of a skin tight. I should have, yep, I thought I was out of those. There we go. Just got set behind something. Thank you, Heather. Again, just wearing gloves to make it easy for me to clean up if I need to. 
Because if for something, something does happen with your model and you need to clean up very fast, you don't want to have to clean off your hands and then have to worry about getting to them. You want to be able to get to them right away. So gloves help with that. For this, we are not going to be adding any pigment and we're not going to be adding any thickener. We're just going to be using the skin tight as our adhesive. So we're just going to apply it to the back of the prosthetic and apply it to Heather then. So yeah, make sure that these are both at ready to go, same time, and then just suspense. There we go. So with using skin tight, you do have the advantage of doing silicone to silicone. So a very good bond there, some of the strongest bonds you're going to get. Um, actually, one other thing I should mention about skin tight is skin tight doesn't really stick to uh, hair. So it has a built, kind of built-in release agent to it. So if you do get it, if you are working with someone that is on the hairier side, like me with my arms, um, you don't have to worry about them having to shave. Um, the same cannot be said for latex. Um, trust me, if you are applying latex to someone, you want to warn them to shave. I have gotten latex in my hair before. It is not fun. All right, so now that we have a good mix here, again, just making sure everything's thoroughly mixed. You could do this with a brush. I find it easier just to apply it with a tongue depressor and just work it out. Just take it, very thin layer, you don't have to go heavy with it, and just work this out to your edge. And this isn't like some other adhesives where you just wanna apply it to the inside and go in and apply more. Um, I just like applying it to the whole piece at once. Um, I find that it's much harder to get the uh, skin tight underneath the edges once it's down, because it doesn't, it doesn't function like other ones where, uh, it's like a contact, like Dermatac, or very quick drying one, like uh, Prosade, or uh, actually Spirit comes a contact as well. Um, so for this, we're just gonna take it, and we're just going to apply that to the skin. And then again, just taking some tools and we'll work on getting this down. And then if I do have any curled over edges, I'm working on just pulling them out. So if I need to, I can get underneath them, unroll them, and then lay them flat out. There we go. And we just wanna work on, if, if for some reason I did miss somewhere, try to work a little bit underneath and kind of squeegee out your piece. So like here we have a little bit of a roll. And there, so we're just gonna kinda go underneath and just pull it out and relieve that roll for it. So there we go. And then one other thing you can do if you want, option for it. So you can actually, can you just go back to this really quick, Alex? Thank you. So you can see that even like, our, we have those nice fine edges, so they go in really well. We do have some spots that are sticking up. So we're actually gonna take, again, that sponge that we had earlier. And we're just gonna take a little bit of this and just kinda go over that edge and this will help one get those edges back down, as well as kind of what Jason was asking about adding some texture in. Actually, I see a piece right here that kind of flipped. But we need a little bit going on underneath there. So, so just get underneath there, roll it back down. And you'll also notice that this is a little bit on the glossy side. 
So what we can do is one, when we apply makeup over top of this, it'll mat it out. Uh, as well as uh, we can actually just take a little bit of talc after this is set and the talc will do the same thing. So this is what Jason kind of was asking about before of adding some skin texture back in where you can kind of come back in with like a sponge like this or a texture pad and kind of just come through and just apply that back through just so that way it's not flat. You can do that with that. So now we have the piece that's kind of nice and centered. We have the base skin tone, um, but you will notice that Heather is a little tanner on her arms. So what we're gonna do is we'll come back to this, we'll let this set up, and then we're gonna come back to it and apply some alcohol makeup to it. But I'm gonna show you guys applying with the Dermatac with another piece that I casted up on the other side of Heather's face here. So Dermatac is a one component system. Um, comes in a variety of sizes. Uh, I'm just gonna be using this little dropper bottle. This is good for like storing in a kit. Um, but if you do need more, there's four ounces. And then I just have a big bottle of the remover, uh, but the remover also comes in smaller bottles like this. Um, so this is just specifically designed to remove the Dermatac. But it, Dermatac is nice because it's a contact adhesive. Um, I like using contact adhesives for applying makeups because I have a little bit more control over it. Because basically what that means is I uh, apply it to both parts and then after it's been applied, I can then slowly press it down so I can get it to lay where I want it to. So I have a little bit more control over it than having to like kind of try to hold it in place. No, I can take it, lay it down where I want, press on it, and it stays. So for this piece, I actually uh, did a pre-paint job to this. So this has already been pre-painted. So you can do this with your pieces if you find that you need to, can, again, conserve time for when you're actually applying your makeup. Um, so if you're out on set and they're like, you have 30 minutes to apply your makeup. Well, between application and painting, you may not have that 30 minutes. So you can paint most of it and then just come back in and do finishing touching for blending your edges. So for that, again, we're just gonna be using our Dermatac. And here I just have a soft white brush. One thing I am gonna do is I'm gonna hold this up to Heather just to gauge where I want this to lay. Actually, this is it's a little large. We'll go for the neck. There we go. That, that fits better. So that'll fit nicely there. Uh, Okay, so now I have an idea of where I need to be applying, let me go this way, where I need to be applying the Dermatac on Heather, as well as, as, well as where I need to be applying it for the piece. All right, if you just wanna keep your head straight, because whenever you're applying a makeup, you want your model to be in a natural position or a neutral position, as some people will call it. And the reason for that is this, um, if, like has he how Heather had her head tilted. This is hyperextending the skin right now. So when she would go back to a natural position, it would buckle the piece, which will make it more likely to come off. Whereas when I'm gonna apply it to a neutral position or the natural position of the neck, when she goes to stretch, it'll stretch with it, but when she goes back to this, it's fine. Um, so just something to kind of keep in mind when applying makeup is you always wanna apply it in that nice, neutral, natural position. So I just dispensed some Dermatac into a container. I'm just gonna take a, a soft brush here and I'm going to apply it to the back of the piece. Um, and this will, this will dry in like 10 seconds about uh, if you wanted it faster, so say you wanted this to flash off in like five seconds or two seconds, you can add some uh, Novox gloss um, to this and it'll uh, cause it to flash off faster. Um, one thing I will keep in mind though is I have found that the more solvent you have in there, the less adhesive you actually have. Um, so I find that using this straight does give you the best bond but it still does very well 
even with being thinned out. Um, but straight is definitely the strongest bond you're going to have for it. All right, so we can apply this over the whole piece here. And we'll just set this down. And I'm just going to take my cup here. And we're just going to apply over that area where it's going to stay. And I like going a little outside of where it needs to be, just so that way I have uh, those edges have a good spot to grip down to. And of course, always make sure that your model is comfortable. Talk to them during for this. I can't really do that since I'm talking to you guys right now. But uh, you always want to check on their models. Heather, are you OK? <laughs> um, so here we go. So now that we have this applied, we're waiting for this to become matte. We want that matte finish. So you could use a, like a hair dryer to kind of kick this off if you need to. Uh, but you don't really have to. Um, at this point, while we're waiting for this to dry, let's just turn your head. So this is now set, so I can touch this. This isn't going to go anywhere. So it's a set piece. Heather, you can move your face. It'll flex with her. So these, these pieces can be worn all day. So a piece applied directly to the skin with skin tight can last all day long, and they won't come off. So that's the nice thing about them. All right. So there we go. Oops. Got a little bit of a curled edge. If you do get a curled edge with the Dermatac, I have found adding a little, taking your brush with some Dermatac on it and then working that edge, it will reactivate the Dermatac that is stuck to itself. Um, so that way you can unfold that edge. I'm just trying to be careful in case I got any on me. And then we're just going to take this. And like I said, this is a contact adhesive. So it's pressure that activates it. So we're just going to go around working inside out for this and just press down. Um, you also don't need to apply it to both uh, the prosthetic and the skin. It just creates a better bond that way. So if you need to do something that's fairly quick and temporary, you can actually just go straight to it without the double. So any place that I kind of see that isn't wanting to lay down, I'll just come back in with my brush again and just throw a little bit of that down there. So I'm trying to make this easy for you guys to see. So just kind of take that, lay that down. Anywhere, that, again, that doesn't have that, we'll just I'm going to pull the skin back a little bit, get underneath there, and just press it. You okay? okay? I'm going to walk around Heather really quick, just so that way you can see what I'm doing versus me being in front here. So I have a little bit of flap right here that I'm just going to kind of, didn't get back far enough, I'm just going to go through and apply a little bit there. And then just press it down. Same here, just a little bit back there. How does that look? That doesn't look too bad. And then same as before is we can actually take uh, a sponge like we did before and take a little bit uh, again of that. You can do this with Dermatac as well and just kind of go over those edges to help seal them down. Just a little dab to them. You don't want to do too much, just enough to kind of seal down those edges so they don't go anywhere. Okay. All right, so there we go. So now that piece is down. We'll need to do a little bit of adjustment from what I'm seeing here, just to do a little color correction before we do the finished look. 
But let's first go back to this one. Now this uh, had time to set. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use some alcohol makeup. Uh, that's the same thing that I used on the other piece as well for the pre-painting portion of it. So for that, we're gonna be using some alcohol. And then I have a variety of brushes. Uh, I have a detailed brush. And then I just have some cut down chip brushes like this where they are just cut on an angle so I can splatter uh, the makeup to get a more natural breakup to it. Um, I know some guys that like using toothbrushes. Uh, do not use, to use toothbrushes. Just buy new ones. They're cheap enough um, to do their splatter. They like the stiffness of the bristles. Um, I just don't like the grip I have on them, so that's why I don't use them. But again, personal preference for a lot of this stuff as far as how you go about uh, applying your makeup, to be honest. I'm gonna remove my gloves at this point. Um, I find the gloves get in the way of spraying. Um, I am gonna sanitize though, just because hygiene since I will be touching what's going on Heather. So just wanna make sure. All right, so for this, we need a little bit of a, mm -hmm. yeah, that one should be good. We want a little bit of a tanner tone on here since it's a little bit on the light side. So we're gonna just dip that, give that a little, massage it a little bit. I like adding a little extra alcohol on my brush. And we're gonna just kinda go over it and just go over it and splatter, dipping back in as we need to for our pigment. Um, I don't mind getting my hands dirty for this. It comes off easy enough. If you wanted to, you could dab uh, I just tend not to. I find that splatter works better. Let me get. So I'm just, different ways to do it. So we want to build that up. I'm gonna move to this side, just so I can get this side a little bit easier. So we're just gonna, again, just go over this whole piece. Just so wanna add some tan back into there, then we're gonna go for a red then as well. And we're just gonna kinda layer these colors, which we can do very quickly. So I want, there's a cheat sheet of what the actual colors look like on the back here, just so you have a better idea. Cause this is, this is actually yellow right here. It looks very orange, but this actually when is activated is a yellow. So the colors can be slightly deceiving, so just something to keep in mind when working with these guys. I know I don't want to look which pink should do. Um, and I actually will not fully clean off because then I get a combination of the colors. Um, that's something that I like doing is just to help blend it a little bit to get a mix of those colors. And of course, Greg, you could also use airbrush um, application uh, yeah. for these uh, makeups as well. Yeah. Um, really what you're looking for is just a light makeup. What Jason is saying is you could use airbrush. Airbrush is a great way of applying makeup very quickly. Um, you just don't want to go really heavy. You want something light. You want to allow that translucency to show through. That's, that's the point of using those silicones is you want uh, translucent. Do, 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 do. So we're just going to keep going over. Let's see how that looks on camera. Yeah, we're getting closer. Um, I don't like, I'm not going to go into the detail until I'm done getting my skin tone matched because again, I do that splatter. So I don't want to um, go in there and then uh, mess that all up. So if I do this and then I go splatter, what's going to happen is anything that I do in my nice detail areas, I'll cover up. So we don't want to do that. 
can use a little bit more alcohol. And also something to keep in mind is we're not matching Heather's skin tone exactly, we're matching her irritated skin tone. So there's gonna be a little bit more reds in there um, than what we typically would see on the surrounding area because again, there, there is a wound, blood rushes to it. So, again, I'm gonna have to switch back over to the other side just to get that a little bit better. Also, any freckling that you need to do can be done with this, done this way as well. And then I always like going a little bit further out of it as well, so that way it can help blend into the skin. Let's see, how does that look on camera? It doesn't look too bad. Let's add actually some darker freckles in for Heather. Yeah, there it is. That's what I want. Since she does have them, that one. So we're just going to be doing a little bit of this, but we want to all right. So then let's see if it doesn't look too bad. Next we're going to start adding into our detail areas. So we'll take our red, give that a good mix here. So you can see why you may want to do a pre-paint for these and a little bit of black, just to give a little bit darker. There we go. And start hitting some areas. Uh, whose makeup are those? Are those Mongols or? Uh, these, uh, this is a WM Creations. Gotcha. Uh, this is a palette that I've had since going to school. Uh, alcohol palettes will last you a long time uh, because you use so little of them. So uh, I definitely recommend that if you're gonna start getting into it, invest in a good alcohol palette. Um, it will last you. So they, they can seem pricey at first, um, but once you actually realize that they will last you a long time, they will last, um, last you years. So it is a good investment if you um, go the route of getting a nice one. So don't be afraid to, uh, don't be afraid by the price um, because they, a good one will last you a long time. Um, so it, it's investment in the long term if you're going to be doing this. If you're if you're looking to do this more as a one-off or as a or more of a hobby where you don't want to be uh, spending the amount of money that comes with an alcohol palette, um, again, you can do coloration with just the skin tight. So you can color. I could do the same thing that I'm doing here with skin tight, with just stippling and painting in to these areas. So fatty tissue is actually yellow, but I want to add in a, um, the deep areas, I want to be bloodied uh, because the blood's gonna show through that fat. So I'm gonna go through and run this through. So this is in the deepest sections. And then I'm gonna do basically what's called a dry brushing and that's going to just leave the high points with color. You, know, you can already see that I'm kind of scraping off those high points anyway on there. So there we go. And what's coming out of the wound, of course, is going to be brighter than this flap here. That's why I went darker on it. Uh, because it will end up um, being a little bit darker because it's exposed and there's no fresh blood coming to it. So 
again, blood does brown as the longer it sits out. All right, so there we go. So that's our, that's our blood base that we have in those deep recesses. So I'm going to give this a quick cleaning. Um, for that, I'm going to actually just pour a small cup of some isopropyl just to really be able to scrub my brush clean. Um, I don't want too much of that red. I don't really want that red on, on there anymore. So I need to make sure it comes out of my brush. So that's a good thing. OK. So now a little bit of white because um, fat is fairly vibrant, but it's not quite as vibrant as this yellow is. So we're going to kind of mix the two. White, a little bit of yellow to get that nice kind of fatty color that you'll see. There we go. So again, for this, we're just going to kind of be dry brushing it, where we're just kind of going over those high points. And you can spend a lot of time on painting if you want to. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can build a lot of depth to it. Um, if you really want to take the time, you could actually go in to these sections in your mold and, and brush in this in silicone beforehand if you wanted to. Nothing wrong with that. Just an extra step to it versus just doing a singular. So there's multiple ways you can do stuff. So we're just going to kind of come in here with this and just work that kind of yellow fatty tissue into it. Um, and this is where that reference comes in handy. You may not think that uh, fatty tissue is very kind of yellow, um, but it is. It's, it's, this is probably a little bright, um, to be honest. Probably could tone it down with a little bit of white after this. Um, but we also will lose some of this coloration once we add our blood over top. So you have to kind of keep in mind the compensation of, all right, well, where is, am I, I have blood over this, how, what is happening? I want, if I want this color to stand out, I need to make sure that it's vibrant enough to stand out. So, how does that look? That looks pretty good right there. Trying to figure out what, just how this looks. Because it's going to look different from what, how I'm seeing it to how it looks on camera. Uh, a really good trick that I recommend doing uh, as far as for practicing your makeups is actually take a photo of it. Take, just like, once, like during the process, stop, take a photo of your camera to see how it looks on camera, because what you see is different than what the camera's going to see, because you're ha you have two eyes versus a camera which has one eye. So things do get flattened out. So the depth does get lost with cameras. Um, so it's something to kind of keep in mind is, depending on how this is being done, it will look different. Same thing if this is a video, take it in video mode versus taking it just in camera mode, because versus a single snapshot versus continuous stream. All right, so let's see how that looks on camera really quick. I like that. I think that's a good job there. If I wanted to, we could go in and do really detailed uh, shadowing into any of these areas that have the wrinkles. Uh, and just to kind of explain those wrinkles a little bit, skin is elastic. So when you get a large wound like this, um, what will happen is it pulls back on itself. It wants to pull back because it is elastic. So if you ever like pull your skin, it does snap back. Same thing happens if, when it gets cut. So on small cuts, you'll notice that it kind of opens. On larger cuts, it actually will wrinkle and pull because of the, that elasticity. Um, so again, having that reference to see how skin reacts to being damaged is always good. All right, so now that we have that go, let's go quick back over this one just to do a little bit of blending. That little tap back down. If any of those areas, again, if any of that wasn't dry, it's going to peel back up, kind of like what it's doing now. Let's just give it a quick once over, really quick. Uh, just so we're not adding extra colors, I'm going to switch brushes really quick. Just 
this. Also, if you are working near an actor's face where you're going to be spraying in the direction of their eyes, warn them to make sure that they're keeping their eyes closed. If you're doing anything like airbrushing or alcohol makeup, to make sure you're not getting anything into their eyes. Um, also, uh, we're not going on the face, so Heather doesn't need to remove her glasses, uh, but I always, if I am working with an actor that does wear glasses, I always tell them to take off their glasses before I start applying makeup, just to make sure I don't get anything on the glasses themselves. So again, just a little touch up here just to help it blend in to the skin tone a little bit better. For it, how does that look? Yeah, we need a little bit of the reddish in the back. Basically what this is just doing is also helping hide that edge because of the breakup. So any little bits that are there. A little bit tanner on the back side. Again, just keep in mind that unless you're doing something where you're gonna be doing a foundation where you're evening out the entire skin tone, um, exposure to sunlight is gonna change how skin uh, does appear. So on the back side here, we do have a little bit tanner skin tone than on the front side. So we need to come back in with some tanner colors on the back, just to make sure that we're matching the back side of her neck. Because again, it's just gonna be slight different. Let's see if that looks a little bit more um, for it. So again, just mixing colors to get what I need to get that kind of break up. Just being mindful of where I'm laying down the makeup. All right. Yep, that helps blend a little bit better. Uh, to be honest, we could spend hours doing this, uh, but let's move on to the next thing of adding the blood for it, just so we, that way you guys can have an idea of what the finish looks will look like. Yeah, the hair is kind of preventing that from sticking down. Just kind of keep in mind your positioning for stuff. All right, so let me just clean this area up a little bit and we'll move some stuff off to the side. And then we'll get to our blood. All right, so for our blood, we're gonna be using the Ultimate Blood Kit. This contains a blood base and then we have a thickener and a thinner. So this will thicken the blood, this will thin out the blood. And then we have three pigments. We have a blue, a red, and a yellow. So these are to control the color of the blood. Like I mentioned before that if you're doing something like stage makeup, you may want it to be a little bit more vibrant. So for stage makeup, adding a bunch of the red will help make it pop and stand out more. If you're doing something um, that's like some older blood or arterial blood um, that is a deeper color, you can add some blue. If you're doing something that's very old blood that's starting to coagulate, you want some yellow in there. So we're gonna adjust our blood a little bit, um, but just to show you why we're using ultimate blood over something like a um, corn syrup blood or something that you're generic, this is just your generic bottle O blood. Um, that you would pick up like at a Halloween store. So I'm just gonna dispense a little bit of this out. So all in all, looks fine as far as blood goes. But I'm gonna show you what happens once we uh, apply it to the silicone. So we'll go to this one here. Um, so if you're doing something straight silicone, it just runs off. Like it looks fine, like there it's fine, but if I try putting on the silicone, it just runs off of it. Blood doesn't do that. Um, so because of that, uh, we don't wanna use generic bloods and corn syrups. The same thing's gonna happen with them. 
they're, they're going to not sit right uh, on our blood. I'm just going to dab that off. Yeah, they're, you're bleeding a little bit. Um, so we're just going to dab that off a little bit just to get rid of the excess. And next, we'll do the ultimate blood here. So so for that, we'll just dispense some out. Nice blood base. So this is actually thicker from the get-go. So nice consistency. Um, as far as something like on the face, uh, it would be a little bit thinner. So we can actually thin that out. So let's take a little bit thinner just to... Oops. Someone put the wrong thing on. Add a few drops of thinner in there. Let's go a little bit thinner with it. So it's nice and runny. There we go. Now we have a much thinner consistency for our blood. There. So now we can take this and same as before, we can actually apply that in. And you notice it's staying in where I'm putting it, staying on. I can go through and kind of dab it around, go over top, put a drip. So here you can see that the blood's not just pull, beating off and just running off of the silicone. It actually does stick to it. It's designed to be able to work with silicone so you don't have that same beading effect. Um, also, the nice thing is it does wash out of clothes and fairly easily. Um, if you're having trouble getting it out, little dish soap does the trick for it. All right, so let's move on to finishing these wounds with some blood then. All right, so for this, I actually do want a thicker blood for the inside because I want the cling. So we're going to use the same batch and just add some thickener to it. So again, this is our consistency right now. Right? There is a drop recipe uh, in the kit itself, um, but for my purposes, I'm just going to eyeball this. So you can see that now it's back to being thicker, which is what I want. So actually what I'm going to do is I have another one of these little uh, sponges, and I'm going to take this and go on the inside of this and just go inside and get it in there just to get that coloration in. Just go in, add a little bit up to the top side here, go down in here for it. Again, just want to work it into the center. We want it thick enough that it's going to stay, but also thin enough that we're not going to keep it on the high points. And then for those edges, let's go a little bit thicker even. So again, adding some thickener in here. So there we go. That's, that's better. Let's actually make it a little bit thicker, almost kind of pasty. And let's make it a little bit darker. There we go. So let's add a little bit of blue to this. Two drops of blue. Make it a little bit darker. We'll take a tool here. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, I'm just going to use a I'll use a piece of broken popsicle stick, and I'm going to take it and I'm going to get it into these edges. I want it to stay there. 
I want, I want that blood to kind of sit on, and get trapped in those folds. I don't want it to run too much out of there. So using a thicker blood will help with that. So again, just being able to go in, get it into those edges, have it keep in those edges. Again, just want it a little bit darker for these sections. Get it right in, right in there. Kind of have it feed up right next to the skin. And you can kind of see why I said we wanted it to be a little bit more vibrant because the blood's coating that. We can actually take just a napkin because we can have that show through a little bit more just by kind of dabbing and soaking up some of the blood off that top layer there for the yellow to show through a little bit more. So just little things can help add that extra depth. Again, you can see we didn't do too much painting for this. This is all fairly quick as far as things go. So you, now we have that. We kind of have that build up. We can actually add a little bit of this darker so it sticks to the edge here, so it has that wet look to it. And then we can move over to our other wound. Oops. It was not fully dried. So how I mentioned before is you want to make sure it's fully dry. When I went to the back, we did end up not having it. So let me just give that a press down to make sure it stays down. A little impatient, I do apologize. For it. So you do want to make sure that it is fully dry. So I just set it down too soon. And because it's not to the open air, it can't dry underneath there. That's the biggest thing, is it won't dry. All right. So same thing as before, we're going to take this deeper red and add that as our accent uh, through here. So we're going to run that through these deep channels. And I can actually get this as thick as a paste if I wanted to. Um, but for any of the looks I'm doing right now, it's not really necessary. But I'll show you guys that in a second after we're done applying all this. There we go. Just carefully adding this in, being precise. Um, I tend not to add too much blood because I don't want to hide everything that I sculpted. It'll drip there. It's not going to hurt anything. Again, this will wash out um, with just like dish soap and water. If you do get it on anything, just a little dish soap, this will. Um, we'll take this out. We, we uh, Doctors like using this for uh, when they're doing uh, simulation training is because they can get it on their white lab coats and it washes out. So that's why they like it. That way they don't have to throw them out. All right, so now, now that we have that in there, I'm actually going to, th I'll show you guys actually thickening this. But I did want to thin this back out then. There we go. And then we'll thin it. We'll, so I'll thicken this to the point where it's like a paste, and then I'm actually going to thin it back out so it's runny. <laughs> so, yeah. Not quite paste, we know a little bit more to do that. There we go. So there. Nice thick, nice thick blood there. But again, don't really have a need for that right now. 
but I'm going to thin this back out with some of the thinner just to get a little bit of runny, runny blood. So we have to kind of thin this back out. So you can use the same batch and go to thick to thin very easily with it. Uh, and even after the blood dries, it does stay flexible for a, uh, for a full day, I would say. Um, if you leave it sit for like a week, yeah, it's going to, still a little on the thick side. Uh, if you like leave it sit for a week, it will start to crumble um, just because it will. But it, it'll last a full day if you put it on. So it, it'll, it'll last a full day. Um, I know that's always a problem is with a lot of bloods, after a period of time, it'll start to um, crack very quickly. Um, also, this is not sticky like syrup blood. So for anyone that has used syrup blood before, you know how sticky that can get. All right. There we go. And we have a nice thinner blood. So we can take this. I'm just going to apply this into here so it, I want it to run out. So I want, like I said, you have being able to go f between uh, thick and thin is nice because then you can add in the blood that you want to stay in place in place and then you can go over with that thinner blood so it can run out. So you have control over it. All right, so that pretty much concludes all the looks that we are going to be doing and how to use all of these. So Heather, you can move your neck, let's see. There we go. So like I said, now that it's on there, we're good. So let's go to this side. So as far as removal goes for these, for something like this here, all we have to do is peel it off because it's just silicone. It's sticking to the skin because we applied it directly to it. But as soon as we want to remove it, all we have to do is just get underneath it. And it peels right off. So any of the little bit of residue that we have left uh, on there, as far as the blood and in the little outside thin sections of the silicone, um, Heather can just then go over with some soap and water and it'll peel off. No issues. Same thing for this one. Since we just have it attached with uh, just the skin tight, same thing can be done. So we just take this, again, get an edge, to find that edge. There we go. We got an edge now. And then just peel it off nice and slowly. There we go. Uh, as far as reusing prosthetics, I know this is something that I get asked a lot. Um, yes, you can, like this would be something that could be reusable. However, it is only reusable for the person that it was put on. It cannot go on anyone else. It, it is solely for that person. So if Heather wanted to use that piece again, she could. The piece will last. It just needs to be repowdered. So again, so the edges stay nice and clean uh, and stored properly so nothing happens to it. And then as far as now our Dermatac, uh, we're going to be using, again, that Dermatac remover. So let me grab some of that really quick. So again, that's this, this stuff here. Uh, Dermatac is really nice because it comes off super easy, at least in my opinion. Um, I've used uh, a lot of other adhesives, and they are a pain to get off. I have spent hours trying to get them off at times. Uh, actually, where did I do? Hmm. We'll use a Q-tip. I don't know where that flat brush went. So just take it a Q-tip. So for this, we're just going to be using a Q-tip. You can use a brush if you want to. The way I like doing this is I like running it all the way around the edge of the piece. And 
and letting it sit for a few seconds so it can start to work down on that. So just give it a second to reactivate and start breaking down the derm attack. You can start seeing that the edges are already puckering. I don't know how close we are on that, but just that little bit there, it's starting to peel it away. There we go. So our edges will just start puckering. And then again, just, I like, give, I, again, I wait for it to give it a few seconds. Once I get a good spot that I can grab onto, do this, try to do this so you guys can see. So, like, and then just slowly work it across the back. You can see that it's like kind of pulling on her skin, so we don't want to pull too much. So we just want to keep adding a little bit more Dermatac remover and just slowly go over just that edge until we get all the way off. So this won't remove all of it at once, but I find that one or two passovers, there we go. Now we have that piece removed. We'll just take paper towel, give that a good soak in the remover, and then just gently go over the surface where it was applied. You don't want to, just, for, just a standard thing, unless you really need to scrub or you're trying to exfoliate, you don't really want to go to town on someone's skin for it. You just want to gently wipe away that. And then just touch, feel for any tackiness, if there is any. I'm not feeling any, so I think we're good. Do you feel any stiffness there or anything? Oh. Good. All right, as you just smear blood all over you. <laughs> all right. Let me clean up a little bit here. Yeah, that one. I have more underneath here. Just cleaning off my own hands. All right. I want to thank you all for watching and participating today. Uh, just a reminder that our next live event is going to be on intro to concrete casting and mold making with Ernie Dojak on May 6th. Uh, also, uh, don't forget that we will be posting updates for any new ones on our Facebook page, uh, email, newsletters, and our YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe, like, and follow us. Thank you and have a wonderful day.